It's Thursday, March 28th. I'm Adam Walsh, and this is The Signal. It is spring, and it even kind of, kind of, feels like it. So with the new season comes a new issue of the Newfoundland Quarterly, and we are thumbing the pages and talking to folks who are part of this science-themed issue. Yeah, so every, every I lo- I really like this show every season because uh, with the new season comes a new episode or a new uh, issue of the quarterly, and then we talk about it. We talk about the theme. We talk about the folks involved with it. Some of the people who put in art or uh, did some writing towards it, and it's always super enjoyable. Uh, and today, uh, doubly so, it's a great issue. Uh, Joan Sullivan, managing editor of the quarterly, welcome back. How are you doing? Oh, we really like doing this too. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for coming back. So why um. Why science? I, I think it did stem from the eclipse, the, mm. the total solar eclipse. It's uh, a rare event. It's uh, had such historic implications. It's uh, uh, such a fantastic thing to experience. And then, of course, uh, but that that is one thing. It's going to happen on the 8th of April. So we broadened out into uh, uh, different aspects of science. Yeah, how did you flesh it out this time? So you're like, okay, well, you're looking at the calendar. It's like, okay, spring's coming, April 8th. We got this uh, solar eclipse going to be quite the thing, uh, fingers crossed on the weather. Uh, so you, you've got stuff to explore there. But then then what happens? I, I think almost immediately Robin, uh, who you're going to be speaking to soon, came in with an idea of um, counter spells and how people – uh, protected themselves from um, evil and different kinds of magic. And I won't say anything more about it because she is here and she knows what she's talking about and I don't. <laughs> Robin Lacey, friend of the show, is back again. This is great. Yeah. But uh, almost immediately it broadened out into um, different aspects of, of, of the theme. And, uh, you know, then Cynthia Boyd had the idea of moon gardens. So that's a beautiful idea of how gardens can look at night, but it's also scientifically based, even though people didn't realize that they were using science to grow certain things at different times and to plant different things at different times and to water different things at different times. But they were actually, and they were often using uh, old rhymes to to plan out these and schedule this, but it was in fact scientific based. Mm. It was based on where, where the phase of the moon and how that affected the ground and the water. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I was looking through uh, the, the PDF version because, uh, you know, you're, when are you going to the printer anyways? Uh, we're, we are at, at, at the at getting printed and I'll take delivery of them uh, Easter Tuesday, next Tuesday. The all, fifth. all right, everyone, if you're waiting for your, your copy, it, <laughs> yeah, it is. They'll, uh, they'll be in the mail real quick. Just waiting for that ink to dry, Yeah. <laughs> which I don't think they do anymore. But anyways, <laughs> uh, all right, let's move. We'll, we'll move through. We've got a bunch of folks to talk to yeah. uh, today. Um, and also in, in studio here, we've got amateur astronomer Randy. Andy Dodge, how you doing? Good, thanks. Uh, so before I get to Robin about her piece, uh, how excited are you about this thing coming up? And, you know, I know you've been asked that a thousand million times to use a scientific number. I'm a nervous <laughs> wreck. <laughs> uh, I've got all these memories of uh, eclipse trips I've done in the past, especially the older ones and the upcoming one and all the changes in technology that have happened since then. And uh, how do I prepare for it? Just, just getting and I've been producing brochures and giving out eclipse classes. Uh, I, I was at Tim Hortons last night, and I ran into a group of uh, Munn students who were just coming off their fasting, yeah. and uh, I gave them all eclipse classes and <laughs> talked to them while I was there. Right? So that was quite exciting, too. So if you run into a guy who's just uh, randomly giving out glasses <laughs> out there, it's Randy, folks. Uh, <laughs> and, and before I go to Robin again, a mm-hmm. quick safety note, too. And I'm going to ask yeah. you towards the end of the show, mm-hmm. because we want to get this out there as much as possible. Why do we care about safety when it comes to the eclipse? Okay. Uh, most people are not used to looking at the sun. You're, you have a natural reflex not to look at the sun. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of talk about these eclipse glasses these days, which will somehow shield your eyes to look. Well, I should caution you that these glasses are meant to be used very sparingly, a couple of seconds at a time, uh, every 10 minutes or so. Okay. And you need to be able to put them on properly. You've got to check them, make sure they're not uh, damaged in any way, and that will help prevent at least. And, and the big thing is as well with your eyes, you have no pain receptors 
And if you, if it, especially if you take the ill-advised concept of putting these on and putting something optically enhancing in front, like binoculars or something like that, you will burn holes in these very quickly. And before you know it, also your eyes. Same with the uh, phones and these other sorts of things. Yes, and try. sunglasses are not no. strong enough. Sunglasses. Yeah. Yeah. They and do not do the work. It doesn't yeah. matter what you've seen or heard. <laughs> they the have to be certified, a, yeah. properly certified, uh, which is a problem now because uh, certain manufacturers in China, notably, are just photocopying the certifications and not going through the uh, the proper protocols to get them certified. So some of the market is being flooded now with fake glasses. So, so you, you double check. You should make sure. Double check. And we'll, and we'll talk the safety thing as well later mm -hmm. in the show, too, yeah. just to kind of explore it uh, further. Robin, Lacey, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? You're, you're a busy person. Yeah, I, apparently. apparently. <laughs> right? Because it's like, so let me see, PhD candidate in historical archaeology at Mun, plus there's a Black Cat Cemetery Preservation that you mm -hmm. run with your husband, which we've been on. We've done shows together before yes. on this. <laughs> but then, like, you've got books you're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, just, can you just plug the books briefly for a second? Which <laughs> books are they that are out? Um, I have a book coming out in September on protective magic on graves um, with Bergen Books. And I am just signed a partnership with Boulder Books uh, here to do a guide to graveyards in eastern Newfoundland. Very cool. Uh, and so for the eclipse, will you be like, in a, like, what are you doing for the eclipse? Are you in a graveyard for this thing or where are you going to um, be? At? I think I am starting... Uh, work at the rooms, actually. So uh, that is my first day. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so well. hopefully, I don't know what my schedule is, but hopefully, I'll be able to go take a look at it. Yeah, exactly. With the glasses, a couple seconds at a time, yes. and all that, which we which we just said. Tell us about your item in quarterly. Yeah, so um, there. I guess to backtrack to what protective magic is and counter magic is yes, like please. the idea of um, using symbols or specific objects to protect yourself or items or loved ones, um, and. It's interesting from a science perspective because, like, archaeologically we can see them, but also it was something very real in people's lives. Like, that was the thing to do to keep themselves safe. Like, so that was something that was very real. Um, and there's been noted examples of them in Newfoundland, like certain symbols over doorways or concealed shoes, but there hasn't really been, like, a survey being done of them. Um, so I was really interested in sort of collecting the information that we had available and writing that up so people could know what to look for. I'm just looking at pictures in the PDF, right? So give me a description of what, because when I looked, when I was scrolling down through, I was like, I've seen these before. I've got flashbacks to my childhood, and I don't know where exactly, but it's something that, I, like, right away I recognized, which I find, and I knew nothing about until awesome. I, I read it, which is, so that's wild for You'll me. You'll have to find awesome. them to me. <laughs> I, you know, trace back my roots to, I think it's probably Park Avenue Elementary, actually, but anyway, somewhere. So it's, it, describe what folks should be looking for. Um, the most common one that can be drawn with like a compass or a pair of scissors is called a hex foil. Uh, it also gets called a daisy wheel. Um, it's like a six pointed, sort of looks like a flower um, in a circle. And sometimes there's extra decorations on them, but those are very commonly put on uh, objects for personal protection. They're put over openings to homes or like sheds and stuff. Um, there's some really good examples examples at the, um, the, what's it called? The property in Whiteway mm. um, that has them in the, the barn. So they're over like a hatch into where the horses were stored. And then there's um, another one, which is a pentagram or a pentangle, which um, has a really interesting history because in like the early medieval period, it was something for protection, a five pointed star with a mm. continuous line that was very easy to draw. Um, and then it sort of, as the church got rid of these like superstitious ideas, they sort of made them less uh, popular. And then that became it was why it's seen as like an evil thing today because it was like this medieval magic um which is really cool but you do see them sometimes in newfoundland as well like on doors and things yeah. it's so neat um how does one go about finding out more about this stuff like where do you like how does that work there's uh, <laughs> there is not very much written record about it because yeah. it is like a folk tradition. So it's like something that people have to um, sort of see the context of. Um, but there is a lot of research being done in the UK on medieval graffiti specifically. There's a book by Matthew Champion called Medieval Graffiti that I really like to recommend to people. And like lots of studies online um, where people are cataloging their use in churches and, and private properties as well. Yeah, so the, and it's called Counter Magic in Newfoundland, Protective Symbols and Hidden Objects. There were ways in which people could protect themselves from unseen forces. And more like, so what were the fears around these unseen forces? Just 
like again, it's not written down. Yeah, so yeah. like um, whatever they were concerned about, probably like evil spirits yeah. or I don't want to say the devil specifically, but there are like other things that relate to that. Um, yeah, just like evil coming into your house, like bad vibes, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Um, they can kind of get boiled down to like a good luck charm. Yeah. But yeah, they were putting them in very specific places and that was appearing in enough context that we know that like that was a specific use of that symbol like we see them over a door frame in hundreds of houses in the uk specifically <laughs> yeah and, and a spot that believes in fairies and, and other types of exactly. mystical things uh, having some stuff to kind of protect you from uh, the unknown mm -hmm. makes sense and it makes sense that it also appears in newfoundland and it has like a longer use history in newfoundland and parts of like new england and nova scotia we see them being used longer um like into the early 20th century than we did in the uk where they sort of like fell out of use after a while which is really interesting as well cool uh thanks for that we can talk some more yeah. through the show but that uh, i just wanted to get that off the top and it's uh, so folks uh, you know it is in the quarterly right so if you do want to read more on it because uh, i said where can you find it well i do know one place right <laughs> so you don't have to go to england uh it, it's in the the current issue that is coming out there's a really big uh, article uh, item in here on the eclipse joan uh, and it's by uh, svetlana barkanova uh, just you want to kind of give an intro to it and then uh, then we'll go to the next uh, voice yeah well we were talking about it uh, we actually had a big chat about this in the middle of the craft christmas craft fair at the jack Byrne arena which is an interesting place to start to plan out a issue but uh we thought of doing some kind of like top 10 things about the eclipse things you didn't know and um or, and things that you should know um one thing i really liked that she did with this was talking about how how it had been perceived and often very much feared historically what kind of a portent it was uh but also there is the science behind it like for example why why to us the sun and the moon actually look like they're the same size when of course they are not the same size it has to do with you know the, the distance from earth so, but of course, she can explain all that much more clearly than I. And we've got Professor Barkanova on the line now. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, hi. Hi, Adam. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, fantastic item uh, in the quarterly. Uh, and, I, you know, I asked the same question already on the show, but how excited are you about, about the eclipse? Like when it's someone in your position, uh, you know, professor of physics at Memorial University of Newfoundland, uh, like what, uh, what are your thoughts around this? Well, I'm extremely excited. We are so fortunate. The last eclipse crossed Newfoundland in 1970. The next will be in 2079. Uh, there are people who chase eclipses all around the world. Well, rich people. I'm not in a position to do that. But I was very fortunate to see one total solar eclipse in 2017. And I so want to see it again. Mm -hmm. uh, that's unbelievable cosmic experience. Unbelievable cosmic experience. Uh, and you're um, you're going to be talking to stu like on day of, right? So April eighth in the morning. I'm, you're you're talking to some students too, uh, like uh, virtually about this, right? Yes. So Memorial Physics Faculty, the three of us, uh, Dr. Hilding Nelson, Dr. Alexander Selexiev, and me, we are going to do three talks all online so the students can choose whatever time is more convenient. The talks will be at 10, 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. So schools can join directly and learn about the eclipse, which hopefully we'll be able to see the same afternoon. Yeah, and Hilding's going to be on towards the end of the show because uh, Hilding's going to be one of my guests. We're This show is going to be in Gander. Uh, we're doing a show at Gander Collegiate uh, Day of the Eclipse, and I'll probably be doing some stuff uh, for TV and, and other things. And so I'm noticing Hilding's uh, lectures, Solar Eclipses to Black Holes, How Astronomers Use Solar Eclipses to Measure the Bending of Space-Time. Yours, 10 Reasons to Get Excited for the Total Solar Eclipse. What are the top three reasons to get excited for the Total, total Solar Eclipse? Top three. Well, it gets dark in the middle of the day. And then if you're on a path of totality, you're going to see the corona, which we never see. You actually see the corona surrounding the sun. And then as the moon is moving away, you can see a diamond ring in the sky. Of course, make sure to use the proper eye protection. You will need eclipse glasses. 
And one other question before I let you go, uh, and it's the like the history around eclipses here. Is I'm thinking Eclipse Island. Could you give a little word on that, just off of a uh, Burgio for folks who, who are not familiar with Eclipse Island? Yes, actually, on August fifth, uh, seventeen sixty-six, James Cook observed the eclipse, solar eclipse, from. Well, just off the coast of Bergia, so he called that island Eclipse Island. And that was actually a very significant event for the entire history of Newfoundland or maritime history, because that observation allowed to calculate the exact longitude for that location, Mm. which was incredibly difficult to do at that time. Remember, it was 1766. And then, in turn, allowed James Cook to create very precise maps for Newfoundland. Very neat. Yeah, longitude. Bit of a big deal if you're on the ocean trying to get from point A to B to C. Mm. <laughs> Excellent. I appreciate the little uh, the history tidbit there. And, uh, you know, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, fan- just excellent, uh, super interesting article in the quarterly. And uh, I hope, uh, I'm hoping for, I'm keeping my fingers crossed for good weather now uh, for, for April Yeah, Eve. fingers crossed for clear skies for sure. Professor Barkanova, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Adam.